it is hard to come by for sure. We'd have to go incredible distances or work with enormous amounts of ore in order to obtain even enough to hold in our hand. But it does exist in nature to a very, very small extent. Hey everybody, Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com, the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And uh, here we are again, yet another Molecule Monday with no molecules and it's not a Monday. I'm actually going to talk once again about an element just like we did last time on, uh, I guess it was a Tuesday, when we were talking about polonium. Uh, but today I want to switch gears and talk about yet another element, element number 43, technetium, right there on the periodic table. So I want to take kind of a fun angle with this one. Professor has been known to toss around a little weight every now and then. And um, when I do, uh, or when I'm done, I like to kick back and relax and get on YouTube and enjoy one of my guilty pleasures, which is uh, to uh, jump onto some of my favorite channels like uh, Plates for Dates, Coach Greg, and uh, enjoy watching them uh, opine on whether or not the fitness celebrity du jour is natty or not. Right? Are they 100% natural or are they enhanced artificial, if you will. And technetium is an element that we can give the same treatment, right? Um, anyone who's taken high school chemistry probably knows, you know, the high school teacher tells them, uh, technetium is a synthetic element, right? It doesn't exist in nature. But is that really true? Right? Does technetium really not exist in nature at all? Well, today we're gonna explore this and try to come to a conclusion. So let's get started on that right now. Technetium itself is element number 43, has a mass number of about 100. And if we take a look at a periodic table that highlights only those elements that have no known stable isotopes, uh, we notice that technetium really sticks out like a sore thumb over here at element number 43. Right? Nearly every other element in that classification either comes from row seven of the table uh, or nearby. And so technetium is not a mass monster like other elements that are clearly not natural. Things like tennessine and agonison, these really massive elements that have to be made synthetically by crashing two large nuclei together. And yet again, technetium uh, in most periodic tables that you look at uh, or that you, you Google online that, that uh, are designed to show you uh, which elements have only radioactive isotopes, technetium is included in the list, right? Implying that's not a stable element. Uh, so that's number one, right? Technetium, it looks a little too small. Um, to be completely not natural. Uh, now, a second characteristic of technetium, one that maybe does kind of lead us to believe that it's uh, not necessarily a naturally occurring element, is its odd number of protons. Uh, not only that, but if we take a look at the NUDAT website over here at Brookhaven National Labs, which we've been to before, and I'm going to get down here in the general, general vicinity of technetium and zoom in here, I want to point out a couple of things. Now, the first of those is that although technetium itself here does have no truly stable isotopes, which would be indicated in black as a black tile, it does have several isotopes with considerable half-lives. We're talking hundreds uh, of thousands to millions of years in length. So that's not too hard to believe that maybe technetium does have some isotopes with really long half-lives, but none that are absolutely stable. And the second thing to point out here is, and we didn't talk about this the last time we looked at the new dat uh, website, is these, these little outline bars here. Those little outline bars there represent, of course, remember the, the new dat table tells us about the number of neutrons versus the number of protons in a nucleus. And those highlighted uh, columns and rows correspond to what are known as magic numbers. Now, magic numbers were discovered uh, by uh, Maria Gopert Meyer. Um, one of the uh, scientists working on the Manhattan Project. And uh, Meyer figured out that there were certain numbers of protons and neutrons in nuclei that gave it some kind of special stability. And this was really mind-blowing because at the time, a lot of physicists believed in what was called the liquid drop model of the nucleus. That is, that the nucleus is just kind of this mishmash of protons and neutrons, kind of just moving around one another, just like molecules of water do in, the, in a glass of water. And there's no significant structure. Uh, but Meyer and others were able to prove that that's not the case. There really are elements of structure within the nucleus of an atom. And it just turns out that technetium itself is just about as far as you can get from either one of these magic number bars. So if I had to pick an element uh, of modest mass that was most likely to be uh, an unstable nucleus, I would probably pick 
technetium or an element nearby. Okay, so there's a reason to believe that maybe technetium is, uh, is, is not natural at all, right? Even though it's considerably small compared to other elements that we can honestly certainly say don't exist in nature. All right, so let's think a little bit more about the history of technetium and how its instability influenced its discovery. Uh, technetium was very late to the party. So if we take a look at Mendeleev's table from 1871, we see just below manganese a space for an eka manganese element, right? An element below manganese that has, in his prediction, an atomic mass of 100. And that's actually very, very close. It turns out some of the most stable isotopes of technetium have masses of about 97, 98, 99 atomic mass units. And so uh, he remarkably uh, accurate, right? The periodic table predicts it should be there. And yet it took more than half a century for technetium to finally be discovered after Mendeleev's table was published. Now, there were many, uh, many elemental researchers who tried to find element 43, believe that they had, and jumped to give it a name, secure their place in the echelons of chemical history. It's gone by the names polinium, davium, niponium, uh, masurium, and even trinacrium was proposed as a name for this element by would-be discoverers who were later proven to be working simply with other elements or mixtures of other elements that had already been discovered. Uh, now, the real discovery came in 1937 in Emilio Segre's laboratory, where he was analyzing molybdenum that had come from Glenn T. Seaborg's facility in California, where he had a device that bombards elements with neutrons. So Segre was able to actually detect for the very first time element number 43, and it had been made in this giant man-made right, nuclear reactor, if you will, um, and, uh, and so it was thought at the time, okay, well, this has never been seen before, although we've been looking for it for almost a century. We finally found it, but we had to make it to find it. It must be completely artificial. And that prompted Segre about a decade later to propose the name technetium from a Greek word meaning artificial. Okay, so, so it turns out that we can get technetium not only from neutron bombardment, but also from other processes that go on in nuclear reactors like nuclear fission. And as the U.S. nuclear program started to grow uh, through the 1940s and 50s, we got better and better at harvesting technetium from spent nuclear fuel. And it was that technetium that was harvested from the spent nuclear fuel that could be characterized. We could analyze it, learn things about it, like the atomic absorption and emission spectra of that element. So why was that so important to figuring out whether technetium is naturally occurring or not? Now, the answer to that question came in 1952, and that was when Paul Merrill, a, an astronomer who was uh, studying stars, right, the composition of stars, took a look at some red giant stars that appeared to have the same spectrum within them as that that had been experimentally determined for technetium using the samples produced here on Earth. Now, that was mind-blowing because remember that technetium doesn't have a stable isotope, and its most stable isotope, the most stable isotope we know of, has a half-life of 4 million years. Now, in um, Merrill's day, we only knew about isotopes that had a half-life of 200,000 years. And so it was really remarkable for him to observe technetium in the stars because, as we know now as well, stars have a lifespan that are billions of years. And so uh, Merrill very quickly rushed to publish this information that he had found. He had detected technetium in red giant stars. And this could only mean one of a few things, right? Um, it could mean that stars, those red giant stars have a very short lifespan and that technetium is there when they form. Uh, but they actually have lifespans that are in the billions of years. Um, and if they do have the lifespan in the billions of years, what that meant was that either there's a much longer lived isotope of technetium yet to be discovered, or that technetium was forming within the stars in real time as part of that stellar fusion process. And that turned out to be the case. So the presence of technetium in red giant stars is, is evidence that those stars are where nucleosynthesis takes place. And that one might argue is naturally occurring technetium. Okay, but what about here on Earth? Is there naturally occurring technetium anywhere 
in our immediate environment? The answer to that question came in the early 1960s, when samples of pitch blend and ore for uranium were demonstrably shown to contain very, very small amounts of technetium. Now, now that technetium forms as the uranium atoms within the pitch blend undergo spontaneous nuclear fission. This is a very, very slow reaction, as you can imagine. And so a very, very small amount of technetium builds up. Uh, in fact, the ratio is roughly a picogram per gram of ore. And to put that into better perspective, that would be like finding a piece of technetium the size of a grain of sand in something as large as a commercial automobile. Right, so we're talking about milligrams and nanograms per ton of ore. To put that into perspective one more time, the paper tells us that for every trillion atoms of uranium in the ore, there should be one atom approximately of technetium present. Now, that's like taking every single penny in circulation in the United States of America and looking for just a single specific coin. It is a true atomic needle in a haystack problem to find naturally occurring technetium. Um, so there's no meaningful way to, to economically extract technetium from these natural samples. However, it has been shown that technetium does indeed form in these ores. And so technetium, while it is very, very rare and difficult element to obtain here on Earth, it does indeed exist, both in the stars and here on Earth, most notably in ores of uranium, where it forms as a byproduct of its natural uh, nuclear breakdown process. So the final verdict, is technetium natty or not? Well, technetium is in fact, natty. It is hard to come by for sure. We'd have to go incredible distances or work with enormous amounts of ore in order to obtain even enough to hold in our hand. But it does exist in nature to a very, very small extent. Of course, for as long as we need or want to use technetium, we'll almost certainly be making it in nuclear reactors where we can harvest quite literally tons of this material over time as it builds up in that more concentrated environment of fissile nuclei. Well, that wraps up my analysis of technetium, natty or not. Uh, links to all of the pages and papers that I can get together will show up in the video description below. Don't hesitate to drop some comments. If you have any thoughts about technetium, how we could get it, how we use it, uh, any interesting factoids about it that you think I might have missed. I always love to learn from my channel, hopefully as much as you do. Uh, also, don't forget to check out my new course with uh, Wondrium and the great courses. It's available at wondrium.com. That course, Understanding the Periodic Table, gives a little bit of treatment to the discovery and the properties of all the elements of the table and also to the table itself, how we can use it today and how it was developed over the years. Uh, so I'm really proud of that project and hope you'll take a look at that as well. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to head off and get on with my week and I'll see everybody next time for another Molecule Monday that hopefully actually involves a molecule. I'm Professor Davis from ChemSurvival.com, YouTube channel ChemSurvival. See you then. Thank you.